We are now live, officially live. Welcome to this evening's Lockdown Live with myself, Helen Williams, my lovely business partner, Lauren Brady. And we have the great pleasure of welcoming Mr. Andy Thomas from Blue Oak Property Network into tonight's stream. So thank you for joining us, Andy. My pleasure. Hi, girls. My pleasure. This evening, we are going to be um, giving Andy a bit of a grilling, really, I think. I think we're allowed permission to do that. We've yeah, got, no. It's not having much option anyway, because we're going to really? do it. <laughs> um, but we, we want to talk all about um, your property investing, what you do with Blue Oak, who you work with, and a few insights. And what I expect from you, Andy, is nothing but the truth. Uh-huh. Um, if that's possible. Uh, I know, obviously, from following you on your uh, your Blue Oak community, which Andy does go live in every single day as well, uh, yes. which is great to see. Um, we're, a, we're a huge fan of that because we started with the Lockdown Lives over on Instagram uh, and then have started um, streaming over multiple platforms uh, to welcome more part people into the party, really. Um, but, yeah, I know what Andy uh, shares within the Blue Oak community is is – very, very insightful. It gives gives so much knowledge away, so much value, um, and a lot of fun along the way. But you know, what I what I really like about you, Andy, with it is that you you tell it how it is, and that's exactly yeah. what myself and Lauren's like. So I yeah. expect nothing else but that from this evening. Um, but just to give any of our followers and listeners uh, a bit of insight into Andy, first and foremost, before I let Lauren loose on him. <laughs> <laughs> Getting my sleeves rolled up. I'm ready. I know. I'm sure Andy's ready as well. Oh, I am ready. And Andy, you've been in the property industry for for the last sort of twenty years or so. Um, I know you've done over a thousand property transactions yourself. Um, yeah. you know, you've got experience uh, as long as your arms, which is quite long. Um, and. <laughs> Long and wide. Um, and yeah, I just believe that obviously for anybody that's watching this, looking to get into property, new into their journey, or just genuinely interested in yeah. business and investing from a truthful, insightful point of view, they will benefit from what you've got to share with us. So 100%. let's go at it, team. And um, yeah, for people watching, please send any questions in along the way. Um, I'm keeping an eye on that so I can, um, I can look at the comments as well. And we'll, uh, we'll release those out. So, no holds barred. There is nothing um, off the table. I'm, I'm laughing at our, our intro. It sounded like something out of an American movie. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yeah. Put your hands up on a Bible. Yeah, all the truth. <laughs> it's not the Bible, though. Don't worry. No Bibles, no Bibles. Um, so, Andy, I mean, obviously, I've not met you uh, in no. real life or in Zoom life in person no. yet. Um, tell us a bit about sort of your background. Where have you come from in business, in being self-employed, in running a property network? What's the, what's the backstory? Yeah, so it happened. Um, I got into property kind of by accident. I had a, uh, I'd been sort of working, sort of in sort of retail from when I when I left school. I went off and did um, a few years in Greece. I'm going to say Greece and not Falaraki because it sounds better. And, um, <laughs> One of the Greek I, islands. It was beautiful. Oh, my God. Best two years of my life, hands down. Like It was amazing. So I came back from there. I was like, right, I can't stay for another season. I need to do something with my life. And I knew that I always knew I wasn't going to get a job. I kind of knew from a very early age that I was unemployable, really. I was a good employee when I was employed, but I always knew that I was going to head out there. So I'd worked in retail, so I thought, I'll, I'll get home and I'll start my own business. And I was living in Southport at the time, I thought, so I started. I opened a ladies' clothes shop because there was five men's shops in Southport and only one ladies' shop. I thought, well, I'll just do a ladies' clothes shop. And I was like, so I did that. So I opened a ladies' clothes shop, off I went, you know, and, you know, picture someone who, you know, just, this was before Google Maps and everything else and just running around London trying to find these like showroom so I could meet these guys and pick women's clothes for a clothes shop yeah. back in Southport. It was chaos. You had but no fashion background. Like it wasn't a case of, I mean, I'm sure you had a good look in Falaraki on the strip. <laughs> <laughs> are, we ba are we basing well, your fashion know-how on, like it was just purely, I see a need in the market. There's no clothes shops for women in Southport. I'm going to go yeah. fill it. It was that. It was just, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, you know, a, an emotionless decision. It was just a business decision. I was just like, I stand more chance of making money with a ladies' clothes shop than I do with a men's because I know about as much about 
men's fashion do that like just because I wear men's clothes didn't make me fashionable. So I was just kind of <laughs> just just I'm very ready, fire, aim sort of thing, and I've always have been. And I just kind of went went out and off off I went and when I did it. I had worked in clothes shops, so I had worked. I was like been the manager of a couple of clothes shops in Southport, so I had that experience. But yeah. you know what experience is that? Folding and clothes. Tell me, did any- Andy, did any of your like family members run businesses? Where was this entrepreneurial confidence or spark from? Had you yeah. seen other people running the show for themselves? Good question. Like, and do you know what? No. Um, my father did have a a news agent in Liverpool when I was very young, and um, it was just like a yeah, it was a news agent in Liverpool, and it was you know he had like penny sweets when penny sweets were a penny, and yeah. you know he had newspapers, Roy the Rovers, and all that, and also had top shelf magazines which you know kind of form the basis of my sexual education so when I was very very young so yeah so so there was that but it was never like drilled into me it just yeah. I just knew I think I just I knew from college really I did business studies at college and the teacher one day just asked a question of the class and like 22 people answered it differently and they were all right and I was like that really stuck with me and I don't remember much about my childhood really but that stuck with me and I was just like, there's something in this. It just made me think that just, you know, if, you, if you're if you passionate about something, if you pick a product, we all answered about what business would we do. It's just like, yeah, that's right. That bit's wrong. I was like, so hold on. So I can go out and run my own business, be my own boss. So yeah. that struck with me from like, is it, you know, a late teenager, whatever age you do, you know, business was at 16, 17. But even yeah. before that, you know, I, I had, you know, at the lemonade stand, I was washing yeah. cars and, you know, I had all, all that like, usual stuff when I was a kid. But yeah, there was no one really around me. My mum worked her heart out my dad was a joiner builder he had the 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 news agents for a time you know he was just working my brother very very hard working guy as well and seven years older so I actually had that you know visual aid to 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 work off if you like so just watched him work very hard as well so no good I don't know where it came from but I just knew I just wanted to be my own person so that's where it came from so yeah do you want to know a really weird coincidence so my parents ran a, a news agent's card shop when I was born. So oh, I was really? born into a news agent's, um, I don't know if I've told you that, Helen. Um, it was no. called Cards and Candy, um, only for a couple of years. Um, but mm. same thing, like, I think one thing that so many people, when you meet them and they go, they go I can't really explain this entrepreneurial thing, but you've yeah. just nailed a couple of things here. Work ethic, you saw yeah. your parents work and graft. Yeah. There was a couple of seeds planted in your early like adolescence. But then, you know, I know you joked there I and mean, when you made reference to going abroad to work, but I'm guaranteeing you were working on commission in Greece. I was on commission and I worked the the, the owner, the Saki, I, I I was the only person really on that island that worked for the same family for two years. Everyone else was getting sacked and moving jobs. Saki fell in love with me because one we were we were selling fish bowls, so we'd sell the fish bowls, and we'd sell the fish bowls. But the fish bowls take up loads of ice, so we'd be selling them, selling them, selling them. They'd do them, and then we'd just we'd run out of ice, and everyone's coming in complaining about the ice. So I was like, we're throwing the, we run out of ice because the fish bowls are taking them. Saki yeah. caught me in the back one day, emptying the residual off the fish bowl into the sink and putting the ice back in the ice pack. Oh, yeah, no. I mean, can you imagine that? Right, I'm prob I probably started COVID way back then doing that. No wonder everyone was ill on that. Disgusting. Yeah. I, was wa- yeah. I, used to wash, I used to wash the straws and put them back in. And Saki was just like, you are my brother. That's it. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it, it was that. But I always had that thing in my head. I was like, how can I make this easier for everyone? Um, yeah. So, yeah, but absolutely. Yeah, 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 100%. So I've always had that oh. sort of in me. Yeah. So what, what was your first um, step into property? You know, when Helen was saying there, you have a thousand property transactions under your belt. Yeah. I mean, that blows me away. So what yeah. what... What was the first step into property? Yeah. So the How first step, go? yeah, so it was off the back of the clothes shop. I had the, the ladies' clothes shop, and that was up and running, doing what it was doing. And it was actually making money, but didn't have to make a lot of money back then. I was still living at home. You know, I didn't have any bills. You know, so it was it was making money, and it was enough for me to, you know, to get by and do whatever I was doing back then. And then a friend of mine came to me. It was just like, you know, if you ever, you know, saw that I was doing sort of quite well. You know, I had a new Mini Cooper and, you know, blah, 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 and a clothes shop, you know, brilliant, classic. And he came to me, just said, have you ever thought about property? I was like, no, never, never, you know, really don't know anything about it. So he puts this beautiful brochure in front of me and he was just like, well, look at this. And it was an off-plan apartment in Liverpool. I was like, ooh, pretty, gorgeous, like marketing material. 
So I did the maths. I was like, the shop was costing me 18,000 a year in business rates. I had to be there every day. I had about 22 part-time staff that I didn't need because I just gave any girl that came in the shop and asked me for a job, a job because I'm stupid. So, you know, so, so I had all that going on to deal with. And I was going down to London and buy all this stock that was, you know, selling, not selling, all that yeah. going on. And I thought on this, at the, at the time, property prices were, you know, going up. So what year I, are we talking? This was like 2000 and, 2003, 2004. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, th property prices were going. You didn't know what yeah. was coming then. So um, I, I, so I took all the money out. I was like, right, I'm in. So I took all the money out of the shop. And I bought my first property, which was an off-plan apartment in Liverpool. And that was it. But then, so I closed the shop down. I didn't close it. Someone else took it over and I, I sold it. But it just meant that they I, they finished the lease off for me. They just took over the, the like the unit. Um, and But then I had no job, no savings, no income, and a mortgage impending. Ready, fire, aim, as always. And yeah. Probably so, a self mortgage back in 2003 as well, right? I think I got it with a blockbuster card and like yeah, you know yeah. you know just just my, my my own signature you know it was crazy yeah. back then so then crazy, I saw yeah. it meant mental so I needed a job and my friend had a mortgage company in Southport um called Hamilton Mortgages so he gave me a job he said look why don't you come in here train to be a mortgage broker uh, and while you what just work in the office processing the mortgage it's mind normally boring do you see my qualification I was like happy sold like 15 grand a year or something like that you know, and I was just doing my CMAT qualification. And so from there, I just, I was learning the house buying process. And the lad sat opposite me was uh, Rich Cowling. He'd been in for about a year and a half, been qualified, had a little portfolio. I was like, oh, I've just bought a property. He was like, oh yeah. So I showed him it and he was just like, he was just like, what have you done here? And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, I bought property. He's like, have you actually done any like due diligence? I was like, done what? Due diligence? <laughs> Can't even spell it, pal. I was like, what are you talking about? So he's like, so he did, he was on the computer tapping away. He was like, the rents in that building don't even cover your mortgage payments. And I was like, what? He's like, you're going to manage it yourself. He went, I went, no. And I went, no. And he went, Kush. he said, right, it's going to cost you about 350 quid a month. Have you got that? And I was like, no. And he was just like, right, so come with me. So he marched me into the office, into Nick's office. Nick looked at it. He laughed even harder than Rich did. And he went, leave it with us. Leave it with us. <laughs> Two weeks later, they were just like, they called me back into the office. They said, good news, we've sold the flat. I was like, sound, how much do I make? I'm like, you don't make anything. You get to not go bankrupt. So, yeah. um, and I had to pay the, the, I had to pay the investors legal fees. So it cost me in the end, I had to borrow two and a half grand off my dad to just get out of that, that property. So that was my first experience of property, which wasn't a great one. So from there, I had to, I then I decided like, well, it's probably, I don't want to do that again. I wasn't yeah. put off by it. I was like, let's, let's learn, you know, before I go ahead. So I was in this office and we, we weren't just a mortgage company. We were, we were bringing in, we'd go out and find sites. We'd, uh, we'd package up the sites. We'd sell them. Back then I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was packaging deals. We were bringing investors in. We were bringing letting agents in, or not like estate agents in, writing the mortgages for them. And it, it just transpired that by the time, I qualified as a mortgage broker that I was better at going out and winning the business for the company than I ever was sitting across a desk and, yeah. and writing, you know, filling up, filling in paperwork for other people. So, so I did that. So he made me the BDM of the company. So I was going out and I was bringing in deals and then I was bringing in the investors. And I was mining them up and then I was writing some of the mortgages and it was just, you couldn't miss back then, Lauren, like you just said, it was just self sir It was BM, it was, you know, Birmingham Midshires, Mortgage Express, yeah. you know, it was, it was chaos. It was absolutely looking back. It was, it madness. was madness. Like when looking back, I, I honestly, I cringe at like how bad it was. You know, we were sending the underwriters like flowers and um, like bottles of wine just to get oh, deals. Oh, those were the days. Honestly, <laughs> right? And like literally, it was just it was it was madness. But and I was doing really well. I was I was earning great money from doing that. I was on commission and stuff. And Rich, uh, sorry, Nick was just like, yeah, you need to, you know, you you. you you're a crap mortgage broker. Just, just go and do that. So off I went. I was out just bringing in, um, bringing in money for the company. But I was still making other people rich. I was watching all these other people make money. What I know now was false money um, because of what was coming. You know, with 2008. Yeah. So, I, and then I went off and I just sort of thought, well, now I know how to find them. I know how to engage with mortgage brokers. I know how to raise money. I know how to find investors. And my dad's a builder. So, um, so I started looking for deals for myself. So, so you had a little mini apprenticeship. The way I'm hearing this is you were always, I love that saying that uh, you've got uh, ready, fire, aim. 
you yeah. weren't terrified. You lost money on your first deal because you, you weren't detail oriented. <laughs> to, to put it put it politely, mm -hmm. um, but then you started watching people do it, make all these moves, and thought, "I'll have a slice of that." Yeah. So then, two thousand and eight, nine, ten came in. Yeah, we can. We all know what happened in those years. Yeah. At that point, did you ever think I'm just going to walk away? From property and i'm just going to leave it over you know to, for someone else to do or was that actually the making of what propelled you forward at that point yeah it definitely was because but when when 2008 came around when the recession came we had uh, we built up an unencumbered portfolio so we were going out the first house i bought after when my father was with uh, was with uh was over four credit cards so for, for cash wow. so i bought it for like, like twenty eight thousand pounds my dad did the refurb um, and we flipped it on and made some money. We repeated the process. So we were just self-funded, just self-funded, self-funded, self-funded. And um, and the model was we'd we'd flip th flip three, four, keep one. The funds of the three or four would fund the one. And we just kept we just kept the, we just kept doing we kept doing it kept doing it. But our exit strategy was taken away when two thousand eight came along because our no one the banks shut the doors. So we couldn't sell to first time buyers, next time buyers, or anyone else. We could possibly sell to investors, but the margin wasn't quite right. They weren't going to buy a fully a full price product off us when they could just go to the auctions and get it forty p forty p on the pound. So there was no margin there. So when the yeah when the recession came, I was me and my dad had to shut shut up shop as it were. We just stopped doing that because it was it just wasn't worth it. Even though there was cheap stock, we didn't have enough collateral in the bank. Didn't have enough money in the bank to go out and and just repeat the process because we didn't have the extra strategy. So we were going to run out of money. So I just said to my dad, I said, look, just sit tight. I'll figure something out. So I just started going out and sourcing deals for cash-rich investors. Um, I knew how to, I still knew how to source them. I was really good at that. And they were just paying me, you know, sourcing fees, 3,000, 5,000 pounds. So I went out and did that through the recession. And that was good fun. Um, really good fun. Idiotic, really, because I thought I was smart because I was, everyone else was going pop and I was earning money. I was like, I'm smart than everyone else. I'm earning money here. But what I should have been doing was accumulating assets at 40p on the pound. Instead, I was more concerned about the three thousand pounds and work how quickly I could spend that in Ibiza. So that was Yeah. It's that short term and it's funny because I don't know. I'm guessing here from the timeline you've given me from mm -hmm. Falaraki to you see Matt Mortgage broke in apprenticeship stage to yeah. here. You're early twenties now, right? Yeah, I was 28 when the recession came. Yeah, you know? so you're having, you know, like I say, at that point, you're like, you're, you're income, your fixed expenses are low. You're able to live at home with family. You don't have dependents at this stage, I don't think. So you've got, mm. you know, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> so you've got a couple of grand a month coming in. And it's yeah. like, you know, the rest of the world's in quite a, a tiresome state at this point financially. Yeah. And oh. you were like holding on to it. So my, best month, my best month was 28 grand. I, I took 28 grand in sourcing fees one month. No yeah. one watched, no one with the hand on my shoulder telling me what yeah. I should do with it. I was just like, I beat the villager on me. No fucking yeah. problem. You know, it was just, it was, I, I wasn't, yeah, and it was just, I was just having fun. And it was just, you couldn't, I was newly single, just moved to Manchester. Wild horses couldn't have made me do it differently. And I, I don't yeah. regret what I did, but I look back and I kind of regret what I did. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, so it's one of those is it a sunk cost fallacy but okay let, let's fast forward then for people who i mean brilliant to understand this because now we're getting the grips of like who yeah. you are your character what's brought you how have we got to this 1000 properties what happened in between 2010 and 2020s yeah so with so a lot of that was was so a lot of that was soaked up in the actual transactions that i did with hamilton mortgages then there was all the deals that we did you know with my father and stuff which accumulated to a lot then what I did was I found creative strategies um, in in about and by creative strategies I mean a lease option contract. So someone showed me a lease option contract at the back end of like 2010 um, and 2009, 2010. Sorry, the back end of 2009, beginning of 2010. And the, the lease option contract, what I took from it was it was just like I could, I could control someone else's property without having to buy it. And bearing in mind, I'm coming from a buying stuff for cash, mortgage, you know, background, even though I'd never actually used a residential mortgage at the, up till this point because I've done everything for cash. Mm. And and then I thought this, I was like, so I can go out and control people's properties just with a contract. And they were like, yeah. And I was like, like the, the, the source, the people that gave me the source weren't the most reliable people in the world. Let's just say that. And <laughs> so I, I thought, well, I'm going to get this checked. So I took the contracts 
I read through it cover to cover, read through it again and again, highlighted the bits I didn't understand, and I went to three different sets of solicitors. And I said, look, is this right? You know, is this a legal thing? Or like, it's a bit light, the contract, but in essence, it's right. If you can get a, a vendor to sign that, you know, that piece of paper, you can control their property. And I was like, done. So, so from a rocky property in, um, point of view, so I know obviously yeah. Helen's got years of experience in it. I've got a little bit. What what does that mean? Like if, if we've got people watching this now and they're like, what, what, what's this lease contract? Yeah. What does it mean? So a lease option basically means you have the option to buy. Sorry, the, yeah, you have the option to buy, but not the obligate. Sorry, the, the option to buy, but not the obligation. The seller has to sell. So when they enter into this contract with you, you agree a purchase price, £100,000, and you agree a term for the, prom, the, the the contract. That could be three years, five years. The sweet spot's normally about between five and seven years. And that purchase price is fixed for that time. So you have to do a bit of due diligence and make sure you're not overpaying. You maybe want to allow for a bit of capital gain so you, you sweeten the deal for the, for, the, for the vendor. And that fact price is fixed. Any gain over, any capital gain over and above the £100,000 is yours to keep. Now, you can ex you can exercise the option at any time, either by buying it for the price agreed. So if it's worth 130, 140, 150, you're buying it for 100. If you, what you all can also do is reassign the option, which means you can actually sell it. So if you sell it for 150 and you've agreed 100, everything over and above 100,000 is yours to keep. Yes. So, so that's it. So I ran with that. <laughs> I really, really ran with that. And back then, no one else was doing it. You know, really, yeah. there's a few people doing it but not like it is now you know you can just throw a dart out your window you'll hit someone selling a, a rent to rent you know lease option course and back then i was just you know people look at me like i was inventing fire you know yeah. for the first time and it was just like you can't do that i was like no we really can and bearing I'm in mind <laughs> we're, we're coming out the back of the recession there's still a lot of pain 2009 there was still a lot of pain the banks didn't know how much the, the banks literally did not know how much debt they had in the market they were trying to crystallize mm -hmm. the losses they didn't know and it was just landlords literally and so i just what what i also did is i genuinely but i genuinely did want to help people that was always a driving force in my in my life and i genuinely wanted to help people i was like i've got a solution here you, they couldn't sell the properties because they couldn't sell them because they were upside down because they'd done the same day mortgage express remortgage thing that's on them and at the same time giving them back had a massively long long lasting effect but i had this other solution I was like you don't have to sell them You've got no money to fix them because these portfolios were in tatters. Because what I was finding was portfolio landlords. First portfolio I took on was 44 properties. So bearing in mind everything I've done from 2004 up until 2009, now I'm just bringing in portfolios, 44 at a time, you know, 30 at a time, 22 at a time. My What I did for them, and which was very unique, and I don't know anyone that's ever done it since, was, well, it's probably not been in that situation, was... They didn't know how bad it was. They didn't know how bad the portfolios were. So I just said, right, just give me the information. Give me the spreadsheet. Give me the contact details for who's got the keys. I'll tell you how bad it is. And I literally just got in my car, and it took however long it took, two weeks. And I drove around every property, knocked on every door, spoke to every tenant, spoke to every letting agent, put a schedule of work together for each property, went back with a file this thick. I went, there's your portfolio. That's where it's okay. That's where it's crap. That is where you're hemorrhaging money. There's the solution. If you want me to do it, we can do it. And they were just like, take the keys. They literally couldn't give me the keys quick enough. So yeah. I was just bringing portfolios into my into my into into my portfolio, controlled with lease op with like lease option contracts. And then I was having to you know go and fix the problems. The first thing I did, I was just fixing the ugly ducklings. I went straight for the ugly ducklings and I fixed them. Fixed them. Brought the portfolio up so it was cash flowing. Made sure the vendors were then getting a a, a profit where they were actually recognising a loss before I came in. They were happy. The portfolio was still in negative equity, but at least they were just treading water. And yeah. I just, you know, and I just, so, and I just, I was just taking the income for as long as we could and just until the market turned. So I just started doing that and I just got, I don't know, I just got, you help one portfolio landlord out, they tend to know other portfolio landlords. And that's what I was doing. And, you know, and I took my own portfolio up to 134 properties, just doing that exact model. And I flipped, I flipped. At, the, at its peak, I'd, I self-managed a lot and I had 26 HMOs within that because I that's the other thing I started doing in 2010 was HMOs. So I was looking at these portfolios, knackered single lets. So I was like, that's got three bedrooms and two lounges. That's a four-bed, five-bed HMO. So I was taking yep. this, agreeing a £150 payment with them and then renting them out for £1,200, £1,300, paying the bills and clearing £800, £900. 
So it was chaos, you know, and chaos, but clearly you were doing stuff that the things that popped into my head here Andy, as, as you're talking a couple of things yeah. number one is you can see where your mindset shifted you were solving problems there was when you look at these portfolio landlords and again really interesting like i've got lots of family who've had property portfolios and when yeah. when things went rough in that period yeah. we see this myself and helen with lots of clients whether it be in property in any business it can be very easy to just want to get under the covers not look up and not want to look at the numbers and you came in and went give me the keys mm -hmm. give me the contact details i'm going to go and find out how bad this has got yeah then you offered a solution but you you mentioned something in the very first thing you told us that you said you did things without much emotion yeah. so you you want to you do care about people that's very evident from what you've said you're not trying yeah. to just make a quick book and rip anybody off far yeah. from it but yeah. you were emotionless and that you were like let me get the figures yeah let's get the facts let me tell you what the solution is yeah. But then when you were able to look at these houses and multiple occupancy, yeah. you could just see things clearly because you were detached and taking a step back. Do you think, yeah. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. There was, I think there was, there was, there was a slight bit of an emotion in it with the, with helping the port. Bearing in mind, I was, I was financially, I was doing really well. So the, I certainly wasn't driven by money at this stage. I was driven by something else. And we'll probably swing back to that in a bit. But yeah. I, I was... I, I generally had, a, I knew I had a solution for these people. I was like, I know I can help these people. So there was, a, and I took a, I took a massive risk, not a massive risk, but the risk I took, there was no invoice for my time. There wasn't like, I'm going to drive you. There's, there's an invoice for the last two weeks for me putting this, yeah. you know, but they could have just looked at that and gone, thanks very much, Andy, and gone away. That was yeah. my risk. And my, what, but I was putting, I was betting on myself that uh, when it came to that point and I presented it to him, First, first of all, I'd often I made I made myself valuable because I was offering to do something that no one else would. I was willing to go around and talk in all the properties. And then what I had to do is just make myself invaluable. I was just like, if he's done this, if he's done this, gone to this much detail, he's not even asked us. We're not even discussed money at this point. It's just like, what else can he do? It's just like, there was no way anyone was going to say no. And even if they did, I was. You know what? Even if they did, my way of dealing with that was, do you know what? I've helped them, and I was willing to do that because just doing that SWOT analysis on the portfolio, which because they just did what you said, under the covers, not interested. I was like, I'll do it because I'm emotionless to this portfolio. Yeah. I'll yeah. do it for you. It's not pretty. It's not easy to read, but you need to read it yeah. sort of thing. So, oh, you can ask yourself. I can see Helen's chomping. Go on. I've got a question because I'm sat here listening to it all as everybody is at home as well. And it, it sounds amazing and extremely, extremely impressive. And you've said, obviously, that you didn't have anybody with a hand on the shoulder. You know, by the sounds of this, it's all very self-taught. And yeah. you just kind of took action and, and said yes and figured the rest out after kind of approach yeah. to things. Where did you fuck up, Andy? Come on, because this all sounds all, you know, as though it were it has gone swimmingly and that, you know, it's all gone oh, really, really well. It's far from gone swimmingly. You know, there, there, was, there, was, stuff, there was stuff in there where, you know, you know, I'd done, I'd done deals with people and I, I've just done, I did, I did one deal on trust and I trusted the vendor and I had investors, you know, from London, they handed money over to the guy and the guy walked off with the money and he was just like, he was just like, take me to court. It's going to cost you that. And I, you know, I had to pay back 17 grand, you know, you know, out of my, you know, there was, there was, I've made so, 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 so many mistakes, you know, along the way. I, fa I failed my way through it. I grew too quickly. I got it to 134 houses without real, without any real system. I lost sight of my why, you know, along the way. I was just, and that was the thing I touched on before, Lauren, in that I I lost sight of that that passion to help people. Right. And I, yeah. then I was just, then I got addicted to the accumulation of houses. I thought having more houses meant more success. And mm. then it got to a stage where I was just like, I, I had this, this, this portfolio and it was just like, I was empty inside. I was empty. You know, I'd hit, I was doing, by this point, I was doing my affirmations and I was doing, you know, I had affirmations, but I didn't have a goal. My goal was, I'll take that house, please. But you know, give me that house or give me those houses. But there was no why attached to it. It was just, it was all what and how. This is what I do. This is how I do it. There was no why attached to it, and I, I just had this massive just peace inside. I can't explain it. It was just yeah. I felt empty, and it, it, it's not something I would wish upon anyone. And I was looked at myself. I looked at the portfolio. It looked fantastic on an Excel spreadsheet, but. It's just I just didn't want it. I just literally did not want it. I was like, I am miserable. I am absolutely sure. miserable. And it had what, so what changed that for you then? Because now I know from you know the success you've had personally and your property network, 
you are a completely different voice of mindset and, and, and the way that you look after yourself and the people around you. What was the changing point when you when you were just, I could say, in the numbers, in the income, in the acquisition stage? What changed? I think it. I think I, I realised that a, a lot of it was on look, based on look. I don't want to say that. I work. I, I outwork everyone. I do. No one will outwork me. I, it's, it's, that'll be true. I don't care what age I get to. I'll outwork. I don't care. I'm 40 now. Uh, you could give me a 20 year old, and you just won't compete with me. And there was that. So uh, the harder you work, you know, the luckier you get. I get that. But I still knew there wasn't enough. There was no finesse. There was no financial intelligence behind it. It was just me grafting. Right. Yeah. And, and just being pretty good at sales. You know, a lot of people say I'm great at sales. I don't think I am. I'm good with people. Mm. And I'm good with sort of understanding people and just listening to people. I, I think I just listen. And, and I, yeah, and I, I, I stick at things longer. I think I've got, I'm very, very patient, very, very patient. And I do stick it. Some would argue I stick at things too long, yeah. but I think, I, so I just knew that I knew what I built was what well, I looked at it as well. And it was, you know, it was built on a, a house of, you know, it was built on sand really. Yeah. There, there was no real solid foundations there. You know, I, I looked at it. I was just like, you know, it's 134 properties, but a portion of them, a lot of them were lease options. I, the, the massive portion of them were lease option rent to rent. It's like, that's with that landlord and they're with that landlord and like that's coming up in three years and that's coming up in oh my day i was like i was like it was too chaotic and i got to the stage where i just it i the, the portfolio had outgrown me i didn't know about systems i didn't know about i wasn't financially educated even though i had that much money coming in i was like it was and by the way i had a lot of money coming in had a lot of money going out and not just on what i was spending the yeah. portfolio was yeah. Oh my god! Like you know, it was something. It was ten, fifteen grand a month just on maintenance. You know, mm. it, it was it was bedlam, and the properties were all over the country, and I was self managing them. It was like it, it was nuts. I had a PA, and I it was. I can't. I wish. I wish I documented <laughs> it more. Face. Yeah, I wish I documented it. Yeah, I was fully like inverted into this portfolio. I you know I was the. The viewings clerk, the yeah. the bed dresser. I was the the you know. So if, the, if we, the we took Andy, if we took Andy out of the equation, the business didn't have any structure or systems. Now again, no. you're we're, we're here talking about property and investing, but your mindset, yeah. Andy, is different now. So yeah. that you know that emptiness, and that not having that that ongoing like what am I doing this for every day change for you but then you've done a shed load of work like I say on your own education your own habits your own mindset so take us through how that all happened I mean you're saying you made a lot of money but I know yeah. I, I, I can only assume you've invested a lot of money in yourself as well and as coaches yeah. me and Helen are always gonna be like best asset you've got make sure that you're yeah. investing in you how did that journey yeah. look it looked, it, it, I suppose it kind of came from, I just, I, I wanted to be, I knew I, was, I knew I was strong, I knew I was mentally tough, but I just, I wanted to just be, I wanted to, exp, I wanted to really explore where I could take this. And it was, you know, I'd, start, I'd, I'd started on the self-development thing sort of, you know, back in 2000 and, uh, it must have been like 2008, 2009, and I kind of dabbled in it and, I, I, you know, I saw things working and I started doing affirmations and stuff like that. And I was like, there's got to be more. And I think it got to the stage where, where, where a real sort of breakthrough moment for me was just sort of when I, I realized I wasn't, I stopped, I realized I wasn't in competition with anyone else. And when I, when I, when I came away from that and, you know, sort of went, went down the route of a lot of my self education, by the way, I've not really spent a lot of money on it. I've, what I've done is just studied. I've just studied mm. and, and read and listened. I swapped, you know, house music for audio books. And, you know, I swapped, you know, whenever I was when I was training, I was listening to audio books. I just, everything stopped. The, the TV stopped. Everything stopped. And I just wanted to, just wanted to see how far I could take it and see how far I could take myself. I got, I got sort of very curious about the human mind and about how much, you know how strong the mind can be, and how how that controls everything. Um, and it it really it, it's been it's been a fascinating, especially the last five years, four or five years have been fascinating. You know, with, with the stuff that's been thrown at me, and it's just um, 
it's you do, I just you just feel I'm trying to say a word that's not been used by some other person you know but like un, you know unshakable unbreakable whatever you know god yeah. bless look, look you know we all love Tony Robbins and stuff but you know to just to get to to be at a stage where it's just like I don't care what you can throw at me I'm good I'm I just yeah. like I'm good I don't care there is there is nothing out you know I get scared you know and stuff like that sure absolutely but ultimately I know I'll find a way through it so yeah. Yeah, it's been it's it's amazing and it doesn't stop. It's every day. Yeah, like, yeah it's every day, and I lo- I'm obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with seeing. I'm. I, I. You've got just. I don't want to say I'm 40. I just feel I'm feel I'm actually getting stronger and better, and just you know I'm genuinely excited about being. Oh, six- yeah, I'm genuinely excited about being 60 and doing you know doing triathlons and stuff. I just even yeah. though I've not done a triathlon, but I will do triathlons and Ironmans. You know, I just. That's yeah. where I want to take it because I know it's just I know it's up here. Up here. So I could I, I could think I could keep talking to you after you questioned about property, but let's 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 maybe look at it a different way. You've just mentioned there about your health, and so yeah. as as a someone who again me and Helen can identify, we talk about this on our socials and podcasts all the time. We had a great time in our twenties. Actually, I think Helen was healthier than I was. I was probably a bit more where you were, Andy. I was like, mm-hmm. take it to Ibiza, off we go. <laughs> oh, I love that island. Um, but then, you know, for me, it was my early entrepreneurial steps when I was just like, if it, if, if food didn't get arrived, delivered, hadn't been deep fried, uh, you know, my idea of hydration was Luke's aid after a session on the Saturday night. Yeah. Uh, you know, going to the gym, can't say it was something I entertained very much. But I... I can see now not looking after my health really affected my mental clarity, then my energy, and then that bounce back stuff that you said, like, give me anything, I'm all right. So I know you I know you're someone who takes your health seriously. How is yeah. that how does that impact for you on business? How do you see that with other property investors or other entrepreneurs when maybe they yeah. you know they don't look at their health as an important part? They look at it as I'll do that later. It's everything it's everything. My my health, my, my it is part of I can't. It's part of my core identity. It's not something I play at. It's not something I dip in and out of. It is. Yeah. It's every. It's twelve. It's three hundred sixty-five days. It's. I. I wake up thinking about it, and it's. It's everything to me. And it's every. And it. The, the transferable assets or skill sets that I've taken from health this that I've put into business are. And it's an endless ROI. And yeah. I can't champion it enough for everyone. And I just. I'll, I train every day. I will train every day. Like even if it's just a ten minute hit workout, I put my weighted vest on. Even if it's just that, everyone's got ten minutes because it's not really about. I'm not trying to be on Men's Health magazine, you know. It's about it's about what it does up here. I don't go running because I want to get fit. I run because I get forty five minutes to myself. It's like meditation, like for me running. And I've, I come up my phone. If you could see my phone, you know, it is just in my notes section on my phone. I'll be stopping. That's sort of, I don't know if you can see it, that. So I'll I'll just stop. That's all notes that I make from running. I'll just come up with ideas and ideas and ideas. Most of my lives that I've been doing is in there. The lives that I do for Blue Oak is in there. Because I'll be running, I'll be listening to audiobooks. I'm just getting inspired. I'm thinking of ideas. I'm stopping. I'm typing them down. That is everything. Like, it's not about me wanting to get fitter or wanting to run an ultra marathon. That'll come. It's about what it does to this. Because... Yeah. If I see rain and snow and sleet, I was just like, and everyone else is bedding down and turning up the logs. I'm putting my trainers on. I'm going out. Like, I don't care. 10 o'clock at night, I've got a head torch. Archie, my dog's got a, a, a collar. You know, let's go out. I want to do it because no one else is. I Has love Archie in the park. got a head torch? Archie's not got a head torch. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's fair, but I want to give him a fighting chance with the squirrels. So he's just got okay. a little... That's yeah, okay. he's, I've got, he's got to catch one one day, even though I love squirrels, but he'll never catch one. He's dead. So I've, got, I've got two dogs and uh, uh, the oldest one now, she, she's, she's you know, she's at retirement age. Um, wow. And I, I still shit myself because I think she gets so close to these squirrels. Like, I'm like, that's to get into the squirrels. I'm like, go, oh, she's going to get you. She's got you. They're too, but, yeah. fa- they're too clever. I love too a squirrel. Clever. Love a okay, so health we've touched on a bit. Helen, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I feel like I could just chat to Andy here and forget that other people. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I've got all night girls. All yeah, night. All yeah. Days. I mean, I'm not sure everyone on Facebook and Instagram are, are gonna are gonna stay with us for the whole time, but I, I, I'll finish off with my question, Helen, and then hand it over to you. Property gets this um, sort of halo effect on it, where people go. 
I'm going to whack that into my little biography. I'm going to be a property investor. I'd love yeah. to get into property. And, you know, you've told us there some of the real stuff, you know, buying houses on credit cards, flipping things, you know, making great money, losing 17 grand because you didn't have a contract and you had to just pay someone because you you lost almost 20 grand. Yeah. What would you say to someone who was starting in property or who's looking at it, listens to you mm. and is, I mean, it'd be hard not to listen to you and think, this is a bloody great idea. This guy's inspiring. What would you say to someone who's in that mindset now and wants to get into this industry? Yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot of people out there selling, you know, unicorns and rainbows and stuff. And yeah. property is not, it is, drives me mad. It, it is a slog, like 100%. There are no shortcuts. There is no inside track. There is literally... It is work. You've got to do the work because I guarantee there'll be someone out working you. And you've just got to, you've got to understand. It is you. People say, oh, you've got to focus on one strategy. Uh, it's just you have to have multiple skill sets if you want to survive. And you've got to also know that it is a long game. You know, we talked about before. You know, short term gratification. You've got you've got to have delayed gratification in property. You've got to get your head around that because it is a long game yes you will have wins along the way collect them but don't you've got to you've got to think further than five minutes in front of your face because mm. you know people talk about exit strategies and i look at exit strategies okay well what's your exit further down the line well what do you mean well what if you get ill or you know family member gets poorly you need to raise some cash or whatever can you sell that well i don't want to think about that and then you're going to fail you might not but you're going to fail so, and it's, people don't, people just, they don't think, they just think they want, oh, I've done a property, tick, let's do a selfie, put it on my social media. Yeah. It's like, you, you can't, it's it's not that. It's not that. It, it's so, so deep. Every property you own is like owning an individual business. You've got to treat it with that respect. It's not a collective, it is a collective business, but each property has a potential to just go sideways. One bad tenant, one bag leak, one boiler going bang, whatever it is, it could, if you've not done it right, it could break you. And it's you, you can it can be done, but just do the study and just think long. Invest in de invest in decades, not quarters. Mm. You can't, it's good. You've got to think long term with it. That's all. Brilliant. And, and all the, what, what I would say is all the stuff that you need, all the education that you need on property is out there for free. Yeah. If you know, if you know where to look. 100%. I was going to say, the next thing they should do is probably join your property network and be connected to people like yourself. And, yeah, you know, yeah. I think how many people are in your property network now, roughly? Just past 4,000. Crazy. So 4,000 yeah, investors, crazy. entrepreneurs, you yeah. know, learning. You know, it's not about, like I say, it's not about the selfie and the ego trip. I'm sure there's some of that. There is in every network, isn't there? But it's, yeah. it's about the, the learning and the grafting and being around pe people in that, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's why that I, right I don't. I don't well. That's why I get on. I get off. I get on every morning, and I try not to talk about. Of course, I talk a little bit about the stuff that I'm doing, but I try and get on there and sort of just tell it how it is. Tell them. I, I'll just tell them yeah. that you know I've, I've fucked up. I've made mistakes. I'm imperfect. It's okay because that's a community I want to create. There's other communities. I don't what I do, what I don't do in that community is treat the people in there like leads. Other communities do. And I don't do that. I treat them like I treat it like a family. Um, I am I am genuinely committed to helping as many people in that community as I possibly can. It's a full time job. It really is. But I'm very very committed to it. Yeah. Why, why do people go wrong, Andy? Because you've said obviously that you know um, you said about you can you can throw a dart out your window and <laughs> somebody who's selling rent to rent or something like yeah. that. Where where did things change in that respect? Obviously, because you said that. When you started out, and you you know you saw the gaps in the market, and you saw what you could do, and how you could help people, and how you could leverage, and things like that. Yes, there were external aspects about the market and lending that came yeah. into things, but why why is property so popular? And is there, would you say, a misconception that it's yeah. easy, it's a quick book, and yeah. you know that it's it's just one of those kind of um, egotistical kind of sectors yeah. to be in? Yeah, it is 100%. There's there's people out there selling false economies right now. Still to this day, people selling false economies. It really, is. selling selling strategies that I really don't think people should be selling um, because it is it's it's instant gratification. Like strategies, they work, but 
you know, it's just, I, I, it, it's not, it's not as simple as that. It, it, I think people see it as like, you know, oh, I'll, I'll sack my boss and I'll get into property and it'll generate income. Just like, yeah, but you're going to be self-employed. You're going to be an entrepreneur. You're going to be a business owner. You're going to be managing staff. Are you going to be managing, managing tenants? Are you prepared for that? Because if you're not, seriously, just keep your job. Find another way to I think property is going to make them happy. What you need to work out is what makes you happy and then do property. You know, make sure make, let property fund your passion, fine, but don't make property. Don't, don't think that property is your passion. I go into property because I'm passionate about property. Why? What in property is to be passionate about? Tenants not paying, section 24s, yeah. the government changing. The, the, there's nothing really in, in property to be passionate about other than the fact it might give you a financial reward. Mm -hmm. That can't be your why. Financial, because it'll never be enough. There's got to be some kind of why and passion attached to what you're doing. If property is funding that, maybe you want to go and build, you know, you know, dig wells in Africa or build schools or whatever it is, fine. Use property, that's your why. But wow. property can't be your why. You know, I get it. There are some people out there that want to grant, you know, design grand homes. But of that, there's probably 1%, you know, of the people out there. Other people are doing it because... You know, they're, they're probably too lazy to go and get a job and they think property is easy. Uh -uh. Mm. It's harder than any job, like 100%. And that's good. I'd rather work 70 hours for myself than 40 for someone else. That's fine. But as long as people know that, but people think they're going to sack the boss and all the money's going to be automated and the tenants are going to pay on time and everything's going to be great. It's not that. It's just not. Um, I don't know anyone. Anyone telling you that is lying. 100% lying. Yeah, so, it, it doesn't sell the same, does it? Though to give the truth, <laughs> do you know the reason I can say that? Because I've got nothing to sell. I've got yeah. no course. To, I've yeah. got Blue. Oak, I've got Blue Oak Academy. Fine, you know, it's. I'm not. We're not here to talk about that. I don't even want to talk about it. I've got Blue, but literally, I've got nothing to sell. I've done every single strategy in property. I will teach people it for free. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't care because I'd rather people. But is the the caveat to that, girls, is that people don't take free advice. If people listen to the stuff I talk about every day and went out, they'd make money. But people don't. They write it in the pad and they get motivated for 10 minutes and they go off and do something else. They go, in, they go off and look for the next shiny penny or the next, oh, God, that, God, I don't fancy doing working 20-hour days for six months. Okay, don't. Don't. But, but surely that's the mindset part of it, though, Andy, yeah. um, that obviously presents everything together. Because yeah. you know you can you can be motivated, you know you can even if you did look at the bricks and mortar aspect of it and the and the income strategies of it yeah. uh, as kind of like a vehicle to move you to where you want to be. Surely it's the mindset then that solidifies everything together. Yeah, I think people. I I I, I, truly, I truly think just some people just aren't willing to make the sacrifice. Mm. Uh, they're not willing to give up. You know, well everyone's let's face it, everyone's had to give up. You know, weekends with the mates and going to the pub and going to watch the football. Every, everyone's been forced. You know, I think that's why I really have not been affected by because I've made every sacrifice. Mm -hmm. COVID came wrong. Really, my life hasn't changed much. I was like, mm -hmm. I've given all that shit up anyway. So mm -hmm. it was just like, you know, I haven't really noticed it. Um, which, and I don't mean that in a very I didn't disrespectful way. I know there's, there's a lot of people have been affected and I'm trying to do my best to help affected people in any way that I can. But... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I just do think that when it comes down to it, people are like, I'm not, I'm just, they're just not willing to to make the sacrifices that are required to go full time, performance related entrepreneur and just go and do it. Scary, mm -hmm. scary. Yeah. You've, you, I've, you, not, you've, I've not noticed the difference though with people's um, approach to that and wanting to develop and strengthen yeah. the mind within lockdown. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, yeah, yeah one hundred percent. And you know, we we doubled down in Blue Oak. You know, we we went with some at some points. I think we would. I think one week we did 15, 15 webinars in one week. You know, just on mindset and accountability. And you know, we set up programs. You know, for you know to keep people on track. And so many people. You know, Paul. You know, came up. Paul came up with a with a program for everyone peak performance. And everyone said there was just like, that got us through lockdown. This is like the first lockdown when no one knew what the hell was going on. Now it's just like, eh, yeah. God. But first lockdown, like, we're not allowed to go out. What? So we were just like, right, well, we're not going to sit still. We can go online. Let's come up with a program and give Paul his due. I mean, he knocked it out of the park with peak performance. And it was it was incredible. It was like webinars at 7 o'clock in the morning, you know, webinars at night. You know, we've had a full, you know, talking about affirmations, accountability, gratitude, what you can do, you know, setting tasks for people. And everyone just like, everyone was just like, thank you for that. It's just, you know, thank you. And 
we we went we went we didn't we just didn't take a day off we literally did not take a day off you know through lockdown because we were like we're going to serve this community that's what we said we were going to do and we're going to keep people on track and it was it was tough it was my god it was tough and but i'm so glad we did it because now we just have you know we have a family there from off the back of it um, yeah, that's yeah. Gr growing daily, and that's evident to see. You know, it's it's fantastic. So, yeah. if anyone watching this, do uh, do give Blue Oak uh, Property Network a, a follow. Uh, yeah, guys. Um, do a, a grand grand job, and it's a great community to be part of. And um, we've had a quick question come in, um, Andy, if you don't mind. Go. Uh, can you share your tips on doing due diligence on properties? That's from Yasmin Dar. Oh, hello, Yasmin. Yasmin's in Blue Oak. I think Yasmin did her first live today, by the way. Oh, Yasmin. I gave her the perfect advice of what's the worst that can happen. So, yeah. Yeah, God bless her. So, so doing due diligence, yeah. So, mainly the due diligence, it depends. It depends. Due diligence depends where the leads come from. But if you've got a lead come through from some marketing that you've done, the due diligence starts on that phone call, that first initial phone call, and the due diligence. A lot of people focus the due diligence on the property. And forget about the vendor ultimately you might not be emotional the vendor is very emotional you know especially if it's a family home so you've got to get into the real sort of nuts and bolts of who they are what their motivation is why they contact with you if you've put a message out that says we buy houses for cash or we can help you with your property problems and someone's responded to that why why have they not gone to a high street agent why are they speaking to you they're speaking to you because they need help so offer that help don't just do it to clickbait people into, you know, getting it so you can make a 25% BMV offer. Help people. Serve the community. So really get into it starts with the person and building a relationship with that person. Fine. You should be literally going into every appointment with whether it's with a vendor or an estate agent or whoever it is, figuring out where their pain points are and figure out how to solve them. The property is the property. The property is not going to change. The vendor has a personality. The property is always going to be a three bed with a drive and a back garden and, you know, damp under the windowsill. The vendor will change daily. And it's about if you have that relationship with them, you've got to build that because ultimately that's who you're doing business. You're not doing business with the property. You're doing business with the vendor or with the agent. So the first thing would be build that relationship. So that's your first bit of due diligence. Then you just want to the first thing you should do, go on the land registry before you do a thing, before you go on right move or anywhere, go on the land registry. Print off the get the you get the address and check the land registry document because also the other thing vendors do is they lie, okay, <laughs> or they or they forget to tell you things by snaking yeah. you, okay. So Mr. Smith, I'm selling my house, okay. Well, what about Mrs. Smith? Didn't mention her on the phone. So yeah. if you're going out to the appointment, you want to make sure that Mrs. Smith is there because what you don't want to do is you're going out to the appointment and you're trying to explain some witchcraft creative strategy to Mr. Smith. He tries relays it onto Mr. Mrs. Smith completely knackers it and before you know it you just you've lost a deal so make sure they're both there on the appointment make sure both decision makers uh, are on the appointment and in terms of sort of looking you know doing the due diligence you know all the tools are out there i would be checking obviously checking right move and checking all the online you know as, you know portals to, to do the due diligence go a little bit deeper you know check out the strategic housing um uh, plan for the for the area uh, or strategic housing assessment, you know, just Google it for the area. If you're lucky, you'll get an up-to-date one. If you're not, you'll get one that's from 2013. But, you know, get the demographics. Um, you don't want to go too far. It depends on the, the area as well. In Liverpool, the property prices can fluctuate from one end of the street to the other. Um, you know, one end of the street, it's all right, and the other, it's, it's you know, it's crack, it's crack at Bill. And you've got to understand that um, and really sort of, get to you need to know your area okay don't leave anything to chance sorry if you can hear archie moaning in the background so he's just that's the whining it's not me so um he make sure don't leave anything to chance i would get two or three comparables from for each property mm -hmm. and really be be really really strict with the due diligence make sure that you're going very very deep speak to local agents you can get due diligence from local agents they aren't qualified to value they're about as qualified to value a deal as you and i are okay there are some very good agents out there but it doesn't really matter whether they have letters after their name no bank in the world will ask an estate agent's opinion of what a property is valued at the banks will only trust a rick's registered valuer so if you get a but they do know the local market and they do know what properties sell for etc etc so speak to them Get the information. It's not set in stone. Ultimately, the property will be worth what someone's willing to pay for it. 
So, and then you just, if, you, if you're going out to look at it, you need to learn how to put scheduler works together. Um, I've just filmed a course on that at the moment on how to do that and how to work with your builder. That's that's also important. So you need to go out, when you're going out to these appointments and doing the due diligence, you need to know, you need to know what to look for. You know, you need to be able to stand outside the house, you know, look at, you know, the roof, the tiles, the re- we just talked about all this, the curb appeal, what's it look like? Is there a shopping trolley in the front garden and is there a squatter in the shed? You know, all these things you need to start. What does the rest of the street look like? What do the cars on the street look like? Is there off-road parking? Is there access around the back? All these things, they, they should just come to you naturally. And you need to be able to sort of look at the house, you know, once or twice maybe and actually put a spread schedule work together and then ultimately get a quote for that. So you've got the motivated seller, what does he want for the property? Is there a mortgage on it? Why is it, why are they selling? And can you find somewhere in the middle? Well, Mr. Smith, I know you want a hundred thousand pounds for it, but there's no roof, and you know, we probably need to negotiate on that. Also, before you negotiate, I know this is quite it's a big topic this way, which you asked me a big question. Also, whatever due diligence, whatever evidence you find out, take it with you in physical form, either on an iPad or print it off. If you want to save your trees, keep it on the iPad, but if you need to print it off, print it off. Because don't believe what you hear, believe what you see. That's why newspapers do so well. Okay, that's why the media does so well. Because whatever they put on the front, they control what goes on. Same with vendors. Don't tell them, well, houses on the street are only worth sixty thousand pounds. Say, look, as you can see from the due diligence here, you know that house there is obviously out of six. So you're not going to get hundred thousand pounds for it. Show it. Be a consultant, not a salesman, sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I could go, I could go on for it all night about due diligence. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Huge yeah, topic. definitely. Yeah. Huge question. Oh, that helped, Jasmine. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure it's one that you can continue into the uh, into the community as well. And oh yes, I will. We'll on that one, Andy. Um, mm. I want to. I just want to wrap a couple of things up here. Um, Lauren and yourself touched upon it a little bit when you talked about um health and like the application over your um. Here we've got another doggy on the screen. Here. No, mine, mine came in and sat on my knee five minutes ago. Got Holly there as well. I know. Oh, see Helen. Oh, let's buy. Let's have a whip round and get Helen a dog. Come on. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're sending you for your birthday. You get a big box arrive in a couple of weeks. Yeah. I'd love yeah. it. We we'll do Please. a HGW go for me, Paige. Let's get your dog. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I, I just want to wrap things up. Um. But it's on quite. It is on quite a uh, an intense. Um, subject matter but I think it's really really valuable that we mention this because I know you're extremely humble Um, and we've gone from top shelf magazines we've gone to (laughs) Valaraki supping fish bowls bottom shelf magazines basically poisoning (laughs) everybody with reused ice uh, from spending money up the wall and uh, pimping it, pimping it out in Ibiza on yeah. uh, Playboy mansions, <laughs> um, and you know everything in between from all your learnings, the education, everybody that you're helping, the number of property deals that you've done, the money that you've won, the money that you've lost, um, and obviously everything that underpins that, which you're extremely passionate about, is mindset. And you've just mentioned about your mindset and then the application of your health, the fact that, you know, you put your weighted vest on and you go out running in the dark, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you were very humble about all that, Andy. There's mm. more to it than that. Yes. Can you share a little bit of that with everybody that's watching? So... Um, I'm, I'm going to apologise, but I'm not, because I think this has got a punch behind it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll track it back a little bit. So... I knew the Ibiza thing, it stopped being fun. And I knew and I was I was kept on doing it and I just wasn't getting the same kick out of it. And so I wanted to I wanted to stop. But when you're the court jester in the middle of all that, it's hard to step away. You know, I wasn't on the outskirts watching it, I was in the middle of the room. Yeah. So and you know, me, you know, me when I started doing January, I just freaked one out. I tried January. And I, I learned then I was just like, wow, it's not drinking thing. I was like, well, waking up fresh is something else. And that really cemented that really cemented my self development. So I was able to study longer, for harder, get more done, and it was just like it was like Andy 2.0. Then I started doing dry quarter, and that really sort of freaked people out, really pissed people off, and you know, just like, well, you know, you're not drinking till April. I was like, nah, definitely not. And then one year, I was just like, I'm just going to carry on. I'm just going to carry on. 
And I just stopped. They're just like, what, you're never going to drink? I'm like, no. I was like, it stopped being fun. I was like, I can't explain it. I was like, either support me or don't. But I'm still the same person. If anything, I'm a better friend because I'm real and it's not this all this false, you know, bravado sort of thing, even though, you know, I loved, you know, I loved doing a lap of a lap of a kitchen and talk going through the alphabet with everyone, 100%. But I was like, I'm, I'm just, I'm shutting the door on that. I'm not going anywhere. I'm still your friend. I'm just... It's, I just want. I've achieved all that mm. by, be, by being the court jester. I want to see what I can do if I take that thing that's holding me back out of my life. So I took drink and uh, you know and everything, all that out of my life. And um, yeah, it was tough, toughest thing I've ever done. But there was real growth on it. And you don't know tough until you've been to a wedding in Ireland and not been able to drink when your favourite drink is Guinness and there's a free Guinness car at this freaking wedding. You don't <laughs> know tough until you've done that. I know I'm I'm joking though obviously you know, I am really joking. But you know so it was it was crazy and and then um I got a call from my mum and dad and it was just like it just didn't you know it didn't sound right you know when you just sound right and it was just like dad's your dad's got a gastric tumor dad's got cancer. And I was like, anyone's ever had that news? It just hit you like a, it hit you like a ton of bricks. And but you know, getting that news when I was sober, clear, focused, you know, not drunk for a good long while, was I was just like, okay. And then right then, I was like, that's it, decision made. I'm going to be the guy. I'm going to be the guy that if this goes bad, I was already prepping. If this goes bad and this takes me dad. I'm going to be the person that's going to be stood there and it amongst all the chaos, people can look at me and be like, I got it. It's like, I've got this, like no problem at all. You can rely on me and I'm going to just get everyone through this. And I made that decision there. And then I know I wouldn't have made that decision if I'd have been drinking, I'd have been under the duvets, hiding, avoiding the topic. And instead I just faced into it. I was like, right, we're going to do this. So we had a year of that on my dad and, um, you know, I forgot that he's the toughest man I know. Um, you know, his dad died when he was 15 and he had to leave school and look after, you know, get a job, look after his mum and his nan and be the breadwinner at 15 years old. You know, anything you th we think we know about mindset, you know, forget about it. He's just, he just, he just had it. It was forced upon him. So, you know, thankfully he had a gastric tumor. He had, he had a nine hour operation. He had his entire stomach removed. Um, and somehow clung on and he rung the bell on his cancer a year, almost a year later. That was in the October, a year later. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, I mean, he lost six stone. And, you know, and he, it's the first time he ever looked like a pensioner, you know, six foot four, 19 stone. And then he dropped and he was just like, you know, I've, I've dropped to 13 stone. I was like, nah, you divvy, you're just the right weight for your height now, you idiot. You've just done a, like a very extreme diet sort of thing. You know, we, you know, we, we can talk about it now. So that was in October. So we got through that and I was just like, but I was just, I was so grateful that I would, for whatever reason, no, Archie, you're not squeaking that thing now. I was like, <laughs> for whatever reason, I, you know, I'd made the decision to to step up. That the strength I got from doing that was, I can't describe it. From actually just making that decision, because I know that that Ibiza knobhead wouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. He just wouldn't. He just wouldn't have ste stepped up to the plate. So that was in the October. All through that year, I'd been going to see. I'd had a lump in my neck. And I'd been going to get, and he said, oh, it's nothing, it's a cyst, don't worry about it. I was like, all right, don't worry, I'm not worried, you know, don't really worry, I've got bigger things to worry about. And then it just got bigger, <laughs> this thing got bigger in my neck. I was like, you know that thing you told me not to worry about? It's like, it's growing, it's got bigger. So they got me in, and yeah, in like the December, um, they called me over to Wakefield Hospital, um, and it was Harry and Charlie, I've got two sons, Harry and Charlie, and I, I just thought, well, I'll do a drive. I don't take my kids to the hospital for days out. You know, it's just, I was like, I'll do over. I'll go for this quick appointment. Because it was just like, they'll go in. They'll give me some news and stuff like that. So I took Harry and Charlie with me. They kept us waiting for uh, like 50 minutes. And like the boys were being amazing. And I was like, I was like, guys, I was like, it's no disrespect for you. I can see you're busy. I was like, but I've got to go. I was like, I just need to feed the boys. I was like, and they were like, you need to go. They dragged someone else out of the appointment. They're like, you've got to go. They're like, you need to come in. I was like, ah, that's a bit weird. So they got me into this appointment eventually with Harry and Charlie. So Harry and Charlie are swinging off the the, the roof, but they're just like, we got it wrong. It's cancer. So I was just like, like, I can't even describe that feeling. You know, I just, 
it's the weirdest feeling. Anyone who's ever had it, you know, personally or otherwise, it 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 levels you. It absolutely levels you. And I'm just mm-hmm. looking, Harry and Charlie are in the room with me. They shouldn't have been in that room with me. And I was just like, and then everything starts going through your head. Everything. Have I done enough? What have I done? What is this going to mean? What you know? How long have I got? Who's going to raise them? Like shit, you don't want to think about. It's just hard to talk about. Yeah, hard. I'm holding it back right now because that was a that was an emotional, emotional day. Just because they were there, I think you know, and yeah. just looking at them there, they're everything to me. You know, those two, and it's just, it was just just looking at them, and I had to, you know, on the way out, I think I had to go and give a blood sample on the way out, and. I'm walking out, holding one, like holding the hands, just walking out of the hospital. And I'm just all these thoughts going through my head, and you know, what does the portfolio look like? And enough, what am I leaving behind? It's just this, what, why me, why me, why me? And I'm like, God, oh, it's just, it was like not good, not good. And I was in the car driving back, and I'm going through all this, all this negative shit in me. And luckily, I like, looked in the mirror, I saw the boys in the back of the car, and they don't know what's going on. You know, they're just oh, the colour of the sky, you know, the way they do. And then I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror. And I was just like, I just caught a glimpse of myself, and I was just like, I was like, what are you doing? And I was like, what are you doing? I was like, I can't change that news. I was like, there's nothing I can do about what that guy just said to me. I can't unscramble that egg. It's done. The only thing I have control of right now is how I react to it. That's it. I've got to. I can't let the. I can't let the external affect me. Internal. I was like, just get on with it. Whatever it is, if this is the hand you've been dealt, you've got to go. You just go all out because I'm going to go out the way I came in, kicking and screaming. I was like, okay. Then I was like, this is an opportunity. And then I realized, I just, I was like, Do you know what? Look at what I've just been through. I quit drinking. I stepped up to the plate for my dad. I'm now going to do it for myself. Everything I'd been through for that, I didn't realize, had prepared me for that moment. And I was just able to sort of say, okay, I'm going to get through this. Or I'm just, it's not going to win. Even if even if it takes me, it won't win because I'm going to leave a legacy so strong that I'm going to leave an example for people and just thinking, Jesus Christ, that boy, you know, kicked back. Yeah. So... I just, I knew then I was just, I was never, I wasn't, I just didn't, I didn't care. And I just like, I'm not going to let it own any headspace. It's going to own no real estate in my head. And I'm just going to, I'm going to push on and I'm going to get through this. And that was, that was in the December. I went back for more tests in the January. I went in for surgery around about the 13th of Feb. So I had to have my entire thyroid gland removed and a nine centimeter tumor from a neck removed and that was on yeah so that was on like the wednesday you kept me in on the friday i got out uh on the sunday i came over to york for a meeting on the monday tuesday i turned up for expedition and i had i had people to mentor and i'm like this is an opportunity i was like i feel fine yeah i've got a cut and i'm cut and i'm bleeding i'm like but i feel fine i feel fine up here i've got every excuse now i need no one blink the guy i'm taking a week no this opportunity i'm at the front of that group blue oak i've got 20 odd people to mentor this is a chance i'm gonna if i can do this then i'm gonna leave them with no excuses so i was like i'm gonna turn up like you can't turn up i was like of course i can i'm gonna turn up because i'm gonna prove to you that it doesn't matter because it's all in here you can t- i can turn up so i went and i did it and yeah, you know, it's a bit sore in places. You know, I, had a, I was meant to have a wicked scar, but you can't really see it. it's fading now. I'm gutted. But um, I did that. And then on the Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, this was mental. I will get emotional over this bit. But Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we had the Blue Oak Big One. And when we were putting the Blue Oak Big One together, which was a two day event of content and a black tie gala dinner, and um, we, had a, we, were, we had a raffle. Way back when, before I, like when my dad was ill, they said, look, we're going to give away. We're going to raffle off prizes for charity. Do you want to pick the charity? So I phoned my dad. I said, dad, pick a charity. He said, Macmillan. I said, cool. So I picked Macmillan. My dad had got the all clear a month later. <sighs> my dad had got the all clear a month later. I went and then we we raised like 18,000 pounds for Macmillan. 
everyone's looking at me thinking it was for me. I already picked, I'd picked this randomly. I got my diagnosis two months later after I'd picked McMillan. And it just so happened I was sitting there a week out of cancer surgery, just raised 18,000 pounds for McMillan. And it was like, I can't, ex I can't explain that. And that was all with the Blue Up community. And like, there was people coming up to me that the, the friendships I forged that night and like within that community and the people that, like, because I went through, I almost went through that. And I've gone through that entire process with that community. And it's just, that's why they're a family to me. And, you know, it's people coming over to me saying, oh, you know, but tell me about the, the family and friends that have been affected by it. And it was, and I, and I used it. I knew it was an opportunity. Well, I, I said this in a post. I was like, I was the right man for the job. I was the right man to get that diagnosis because I knew I could use it to just inspire people. And there was, the messages that I've had, the private messages that I've had from people just sort of saying, you've really helped me. And, you know, my mum's just got poorly and my mum's just being diagnosed. What do I do? I'm like, you do this. This is what you do. You, you turn up. You do the job. that you, you turn up. You have to do the job that no one else wants. You have to turn up and just do it. And it's not, it's not, it's not pleasant. It's not nice. It's, it's, the, it's the shitty job, but there is the strength on the other side of it. And that's it. Life, there is no book you can read. Life gets you stronger you know you want to get braver that you'll just look you gotta look for opportunities to be you know to be brave you know and it's just life will give you opportunities to strengthen your mindset you've just got to make the decision to step up and do that thing that you don't want to do and do that thing you're scared of and those last you know these last two three years still ongoing i've still not had the all clear do you know what i'll show you the letter if i could get it just had a letter from the hospital and they've just basically, they've not given me the all clear, but they basically said that my bloods have dropped. It's a thing called thioglobulin in your blood, which is your protein in your blood. That's like, it's dropped like considerably really well, but they're still monitoring something in my neck. They don't know what it is, but they're, they're just being overcautious. They just get a little bit excited about things. So they're just like, it could be something, it could be residual, but it's still there, you know, and it's just, but my mindset is, you know, I've just not got the all clear yet. It's looking that way, but the hospital just won't, they won't tell you that. But it's just, it's always there. But it's, I don't care. You know, whatever it is, it's it's an excuse for me to get stronger, to push harder and to use it as a reason to inspire people. And even even if it wins, it won't because, you know, I, I've done everything I possibly can to set an example and leave a legacy that's bigger than money in the bank or anything like that. That's what's more important to me. So oh, yeah. Thanks. Amazing. Right. Mm. It, honestly, yeah. So so inspiring. And I had to ha ask you that and dig a bit deeper on it. I because it, to all this, I nearly I nearly cracked then. I nearly cracked a couple of so times. So I, I didn't know any of that. <laughs> I would have, I would have. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, Andy. I, yeah. I couldn't I, I couldn't just skip around the whole health thing and the, the thing without actually then exposing that and i know you talk about it openly mm, and yeah. you don't sit on your pity potty at all but mm. when the word mindset gets used it gets badged around so so much but then stories like this and how you demonstrate yourself and um you know present yourself every single day and still look to inspire other people as you're you know going through everything that you're going through you put everybody else first yes you look after yourself and you have your daily non-negotiables and you have your routines oh, yeah. and you make sure that you're all right you make sure that your boys are all right and that you know all of your business entity and everything else is is, is fine but you put so much into other people and i just think you know the mindset uh, element of all of this with your experience and, and and you know like i said what you're going through right now is just the epitome of what it really is thank you and i think that that there's there is something in there for everyone, you know, you to helping people is just the best thing you can do. And there's, there's real strength in that. You know, if you want to strengthen your mindset, give back, you know, reach back, and, you know, and help other people. It's You can do it every single day. I, look, I just want to help one one person a day. It's dead mm -hmm. simple. And I try and do it every day. And that's why I, that's why I show up in Blue Oak every day because, you know, just in the hope of doing. I get, if I just get a little private message saying, you helped me this morning, thanks for that. Or Yasmin said, you know, she did a live because of something I said. If that's helps her, if someone sees that and the investor sees it, or it's it sparks her to just get out of a comfort zone, it's, it's worth it. That is a that's a worthy cause and that's a cause worth cause worth pursuing for me for sure. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. We're gonna wrap this up then. Um, no, no, no. We'll just stay on it. We can all just get a brew, have our dinner, just stay chatting, but uh <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I don't know about you, Andy, but my dogs are making noise, they're like, come on now. We're ready. Yeah. We're ready. They just keep coming in and looking at me and going, 
on yeah. now. <laughs> Come on, feed me. You just want to go and play, don't you? Ah, he's lovely. The message um, Andy, I've got a Lacky Nosy question. How is your dad? He is, yeah, still here, alive and kicking, telling right. shit jokes, getting everyone's name wrong. Yeah, he's. they live in Italy, so they're back in Italy. They moved to Italy oh, uh, back in 2008, it. nine. So, but it's a shit show now because of Brexit. Um, it, they, they can only be there for three months at a time, so they're coming home. Um, but that is their home. They're, they've been back. They were back in my brothers for like a year and a half back in South Pole, staying with brothers. They've gone back, and now they've just got. They're going to have to come home for three months, and then go back for three months. It's just like ah. So yeah, but he's 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 good. He's he's good. Right. He's, he's right. tough as old boots, bless him. Yeah, but yeah, no stomach. Work that one out. No. A pretty big piece of kit that like, but yeah, just just getting on with it. Just getting Must on be with it. Must something in the uh, the Thomas jeans. Maybe, yeah. maybe. Oh. I haven't even told you about my mum yet. Jesus, she's another level. Yeah. Oh, and we'll go on for another day then, Andy, because we're going to be all night. Me and Helen have always joked that we're going to have at some point a dad's interview podcast, um, yeah. and we're definitely going to put your dad in the in the in the bucket of that podcast. Uh, hopefully, yeah. one day when we can all be in person again, we'll all be at an event and we can. Uh, yeah, we'll we, come to we can bring the dad on stage. Oh my God, I'm just thinking about yeah. the dad on the right. microphone. It's just, uh, <laughs> you no, know, like the camera will be like this. He'll have his hand over the camera. He'll be messing around. Oh, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Fabulous. We've got the messages coming in, Andy. Obviously, yeah. people have got a lot of respect and love for you. And uh, for everybody that's, um, you know, watched this or watching it back on replay uh, when that's uploaded to YouTube, we will be putting it onto a podcast as well. Yeah. Uh, and it will be uh, put out on all the different uh, platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, yeah. and everywhere possible. Um, I'm sure you will all agree that, you know, Andy has shown a lot of insight into him as a person and him as a, a business owner as well. Um, shared the ups, shared the downs. Uh, there's been there's been the laughter there. There's almost been the tears. Um, oh, no. <laughs> Struggled then. Whoa. Still got it. Still feel it. <laughs> Good man. It's the mindset. It's the mindset. I love it. I love it. But, Key, key, key takeaways there is definitely the fact of, you know, it's the work ethic. You know, you, you've, you've said that nobody will outwork you ever um, and that, you know, nothing will nothing will win because you will keep on every single day doing what you're doing and what you, yeah. what you do best. And it yeah. is the long game. Absolutely everything yeah, is the it really is. For, it you really know, is. For your business, for your happiness, for your fulfillment, for your health. Everything is the long game. So um, yeah. I think that's been a, a fantastic takeaway there, Andy. Thank Thanks. you. Thank I've really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you, girls. You're very, very, very good at what you do. Very, very good. Awesome. Well, the nice. community is very lucky to have you. That's all I'll say. Well, we look forward to being uh, in touch with Blue Oak and all of the uh, uh, all of the community over the, the coming weeks and months and years. So thank you again. And uh, we will put all the links in of how you can get in touch with Andy, his community, all of the socials. We'll put it all in there in the links. And, uh, yeah, it's been a fab one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, girls, honestly. Thank you. Bless you. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. See you, mate. Say bye-bye.